Allah commands it. Allah's plan was for the angels to talk to this woman. Allah's plan for was, was for this angel to slap her face and that slap to be recorded until judgment day. You know what I'm trying to tell you about the world of the Quran? When the Quran says something, I want to dive in. I want to go in that world. When Najmi Ida Hawa, Ma Ladna Sahibukum Wa Ma Rawa. Make the most of this series by downloading our free workbook for a guided contemplation of this powerful surah. In the study of Islam, we make assumptions. And when you question the assumption, who are you to question the assumption? Are you as good as them? Are you as good as this person? No, I'm not. But I'm still, it's still an assumption. It's an assumption from a really good person. It's still an assumption. In yattabi'una illa dhan. Allah has given us a religion that is revolutionary. No, no part of this deen can be based on what? Assumptions. None of it. It has to be rooted. Asluha thabit wa far'uha sama. Its roots are firm and its branches into the sky. This is it. This is a profound religion. It doesn't just go off of feelings. In yattabi'una illa dhan. Wa inna dhan la yughni min al haqqi shay'a. And by the way, the, the idea of mudari' I said the mudari' form of the ayah, meaning this following of assumptions will remain a problem for humanity until judgment day. This will be a god. Assumptions will be a false idol that the Qur'an will continue to keep breaking and the people of the Qur'an will continue to keep breaking until judgment day. It will keep going. And then he says, وَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا Assumptions cannot help you against truth at all. Let me tell you how assumptions work in our times. Give you an example or two. You see, uh, for example, let's talk about something people get fired up about. Let's talk about police brutality, right? You'll see a video, a police officer beat up somebody. Oh my God, I hate police brutality. Now, then you see another video where a police officer is grabbing somebody. Before you know the entire story, what are you going to scream immediately? Police brutality. You don't know if the guy pulled a knife, tried to kill the police officer. You don't know what else, if he fired a gun. You don't know if he beat a child. You don't know anything. You just know this one clip where a police officer is grabbing a guy and he's doing this. Now, it could be police brutality and it could be a legitimate case. I don't know enough to be able to pass judgment because I have one bit of information, not the entire picture. But you know what that's called when you have one bit of information and you assume the rest? It's called dhan. Wa inna dhanna la yughni min al shay'a. Dhan, that assumption based on little information cannot free you from the truth itself. It cannot help you against the reality of the situation. Now, let's not talk about police brutality. Let's talk about our religion itself for a moment. I'll give you one example. Famous story, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in uh, a narration told his son to divorce his wife. Abu Bakr told his son to divorce his wife. I was in a halaqa one time and the shaykh that was describing this story said, this is the right of the parents. Even if the parents told you to do what? Divorce your wife, you should what? Divorce your wife. I'm like, oh? What? What, what did you just say, bro? Sheikh, bro? Hold on a second. So I, let me ask some questions. Marriage between two people. Can you just know about somebody's marriage? you know everything about that marriage? Everything about that relationship? No. Is every marriage the same? No. Is the relationship between husband and wife purely spiritual, purely economic, purely emotional, purely familial? Or is it a mix of a lot of things? It's a mix of a lot of things. And if a marriage isn't working, could there be one reason? Could there be one simple reason? Could be a lot of complicated reasons? Or is it usually just one straightforward reason? It's a huge complicated reason. It's a big complicated history. It's not a simple thing. We have, the story says Abu Bakr Siddiq told his son to divorce his wife. How much information do you have? It's like, you know, like a, like a keyhole. Looking inside a keyhole, how much of the room do you see? You see this much? And you say, I'm going to tell you all the furniture in that room. And tell you everything in the closet. Stupid. You don't know anything. You have this. Everything else you're saying is what? One. 
Now, without knowing the rest of the situation, for you to say, therefore, when a parent says, I don't, Abu Bakr Siddiq barely says anything, man. Like, study Bukhari and Muslim, and you'll find a hand, single digits in a hadith coming from Abu Bakr Siddiq. So when he speaks, we, we get very little from him. So the one thing we know from him, if he, if he did tell his son to divorce his wife, we don't know if he told him or allowed him. We don't know how many times his son came to him and says, Dad, I can't do this anymore. I don't know. It's not working. How many times he told him, stay in the marriage, stay in the marriage. And one day he told him, divorce. We don't know anything. We know nothing. We know one data point, two data point. And what do we do with these stories in our history? What do we create? An entire set of assumptions. And then we present them as facts. You can say, oh, other religions do this. I'm telling, I've been trying to study Islam for 23 years now, and I'm still a student. I'm not a sheikh at all. Milk sheikh at best. But, like, yeah, somebody got that. Okay, I'm happy now. Somebody's like, hey, hey, okay. Well, I tell you one thing. There's a lot of assumption. And there are, there are hum darajatun and the, there's levels of scholarship. There's people that are like, they know like eighth grade level Islamic studies. But because they are in a community where everybody else is a kindergartner, they look like Shaykh al-Islam. So then they talk about stuff like what I just told you and everybody says, MashaAllah, oh, the story increased my iman. I'm going home because my mother told me to divorce my wife and I'm going to follow the legacy of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. Because you got eighth grade and the, you know, the deaf leading the blind. And then you get a level above that and you get scholars, like real scholars. And Allah has opened doors for me that I don't even know. I, don't, I can't even explain how he opened those doors for me. I get, I get to meet some of the world's most incredible scholars. And let me tell you, the more scholarly they are, the less they talk. You don't see them on YouTube. You barely see them. And if you do see them, they have like 80, 80 views on their video. Because their brain operates at a frequency that the rest of it are like, that wasn't fun. That wasn't interesting. That wasn't entertaining. You know? So, when I talk to them, I get a very different picture of Islam. About the same stories I've been hearing in the khutbah since I was a kid, and I listen to them, and I'm like, what is this? You know why? Because of this ayah. وَإِنَّ الظَّنَّ لَا يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْئًا حق is حق. You, And we have to be brave enough to face it. You have to confront it. And we have to break the world of assumption within even our own. Ask questions. Seek answers. Seek conviction. Don't be afraid of questions. And do, there's entire, you know, the vast majority of the human population lives in South Asia. The vast majority. South Asia and Southeast Asia. If you draw a 3,000 mile circle, 75% of the human population lives there. And you know, the, 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 the most shirk happens there too. And the majority of Muslims live there too. Indonesia is in that part of the world. Bangladesh, Pakistan, the Muslims in India. Those are huge populations of Muslims. And you go to a place like Pakistan, one of the most common things Muslims in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh will tell you is, don't read the Quran. You'll get misguided. Keep dhan. Don't go to haq. وَإِنَّ la يُغْنِي مِنَ الْحَقِّ شَيْعَ I need you to know as I leave, haq means three things. At least for the purpose of this ayah. Haq, you need to know, means three things. Haq means reality. So assumptions cannot change reality. They will not free you from the need to face reality. Haq also means truth. And haq also means purpose. You know what that means? People of assumption can never fulfill a purpose. If you're living in assumptions, you can't live with purpose. Because in the dhan, la yughni min al-haqq shay'a. Haq in Arabic actually has one more meaning that's not relevant to this ayah, but has you should know it means right also. Like haqqul lisa'ili wal mahroom, right? Haqqul walidain, the rights of someone. But truth, reality, and purpose are all fused together in the word haq. And I need you to know that because Allah is saying you develop these religions that have no truth, they have no reality, and they have no purpose. And the Qur'an is the truth and it's describing reality as it is and it's giving your life and my life a purpose. All three things fuse 
Alhamdulillah, we've reached the, uh, the conclusion of uh, today's session. Before I leave you, I will give you just one quick lens. Bear with me. We didn't get to talk about the lenses of contemplating the Quran. The booklet has been with you. It's only been used as a passport so far. So I'm going to give you just one lens today and um, we'll talk about more later. So it says lens of language. One of the lenses it says is the lens of language. I don't have to talk about that one because I've given you a really good taste of the lens of language so far in Surat, uh, you know, uh, Surat Al-Najm. Every word, the grammatical implication, what's the min doing here? What are the secondary meanings? Those are all the lens of what? Language. And that's why language will open up doors for tadabbur. And if you don't have access to that on the last day, even if you don't know Arabic, I'll start giving you tools that you can access some of these lenses yourself. Okay? But the second quick lens I want to give you is the world of the Qur'an. The lens called the world of the Qur'an. And what, is that, what does that mean? When Allah was talking about Yusuf a.s. in ancient Egypt, you know what Sheikh Suhaib Saeed, my dear friend, he and I are partners in crime when we study Qur'an. There's a few others. But when we study Qur'an, when we were studying Surah Yusuf, we literally imagined that we lived in ancient Egypt. What did it look like? What was the marketplace like? What were the women like? These women that were, you know, talking about, you know, Yusuf alayhi salam. What was that party like? What were the drinks like? What were the servants like? What, what was this environment? You want, I want to place myself in that environment as much as possible. So to understand Surah Yusuf, we actually started looking at his, the history of Egypt and what life was like and their sociology. Because if Allah is talking about a world, I want to go inside that world. We were studying Surah al 51. Allah in the beginning talks about winds. You know what we did? Instead of just studying the tafasir, in, in addition, we studied winds. I watched documentaries on the wind. I read papers on the wind. I read National Geographic on the wind. Allah says, winds that carry, and it implies carry, winds that carry long distances. I didn't know that sand from the sub-Saharan desert of Africa is carried by the wind and dropped on the coast of Florida. I didn't know that. Across the entire ocean. I didn't know atmospheric pressure, entire climates are carried by the winds from one region to the other. I didn't know that when there's a calm weather in one place, it creates a void and atmospheric pressure and creates thunderstorms, hurricanes, and tornadoes in another place. I, I, I didn't know. But the more I studied winds, the more I realized something. I saw more in Surah al Dhariyat in the opening than I saw before. What am I trying to tell you? If Allah is talking about mountains, the best thing you can do to go on, if you want to do tadab, if you want to do tafsir, open up Ibn Kathir, open up Razi, open up a translate, whatever. If you want to do tadabur, watch a documentary on mountains. If you want to know, if Allah is talking about bees, start reading about bees. Study their behavior. Learn about them. And then read the ayah. And your view of the ayah will change. If Allah is talking about a, you know, when Allah was talking about, uh, the, 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 the mother of, uh, no, the, the mother of his, uh, of his haq at that time. Ibrahim alayhi salam's, actually Ismail, Ibrahim alayhi salam was visited by the angels. They said, you're going to have a child. And his wife said, what? Ajuzun akim. And she slapped her face. She slapped her face and screamed, فَصَقَّتْ وَجْهَهَا وَقَالَتْ عَجُوزٌ عَقِيمٌ She literally, she did this. Old woman couldn't have a baby ever. She screamed out. Now, think about this for a moment. Bear with me. I'll, I'll let you go after this. How long did Ibrahim a.s. live? Uh, plus, a uh, hundred plus years. How much of his conversations are in the Quran? 30 minutes worth. If you record the conversations that are in the Quran from Ibrahim, no more than 30 minutes of a hundred plus years life. I want to know every minute of his life. But Allah didn't give me that. Allah only gave me how much? 30 minute recording from his life. So Allah chose, right? Because Allah is very selective. 
So every word in the Quran is highly selected because so much information was left out and so little information was given. So the information that was left was highly selected, chosen by Allah. And of the most selected moments of his life, why did I need to know this woman slapped her face? What's the select? What this? This was. This has to be important. Why does she say, "I can't have a child," and I've never been able to have a child, and I'm an old woman now? So the words "old woman" and "infertile" are important. And her ex her emotions of hitting her face and crying are important. So you know what we did? We read the tafsir, and then we studied infertility, and then we studied papers on anxiety and depression rates among women that cannot have children and the rates of infertility around the world and older women that were never able to have a child and what they felt. And we studied the, I want to understand the emotions of this woman because Allah recorded her emotions and the two words that she identified herself with, Allah decided to put not the words of Ibrahim السلام, in the Quran, he put her words in the Quran and then the angels responded to her instead of talking to Ibrahim السلام, and saying to Ibrahim السلام, ya, Ya Ibrahim, uh, Allah sent us to talk to you. Can you put your wife in check, please, for a moment? This lady's losing her mind a little bit. Can you, can you, can you, you know, take care of your household? He didn't do that. You know what the angels did? They started talking to her. It was part of Allah's plan. Because angels don't do anything unless what? Allah commands it. Allah's plan was for the angels to talk to this woman. Allah's plan for, was, was for this angel to slap her face and that slap to be recorded until judgment day. You know what I'm trying to tell you about the world of the Qur'an? When the Qur'an says something, I want to dive in. I want to go in that world. I want to be in that room. I want to be on that mountain. That's what I want you to do. What world is the Qur'an asking me to go into when it speaks? When Allah started talking about the stars, I took you into the world of the stars, didn't I? When Allah talks about the false gods, we have to go into the world of the ancient Arabs, don't we? What world is he wanting me to go into? That will open up new doors of tadabbur for you. New doors. It's a different book after that. So the lens of language and the second lens is the world of the Quran. Enjoy your evening. I hope you survive the night. Hey guys, you just watched a small clip of me explaining the Quran in depth as part of the Deeper Look series. Studying the Quran in depth can seem like a really intimidating thing that's only meant for scholars. Our job at Bayan is to make deeper study of the Quran accessible and easy for all of you. So take us up on that challenge. Join us for this study, the deeper look of the Quran for this surah and many other surahs on BayanaTV.com under the Deeper Look section.